Dr. Veronica Barassi campaigns and writes about the impact of data technologies and artificial intelligence on civic rights and democracy. She is an anthropologist and the mother of two daughters. She is currently Professor in Media and Communication Studies in the School of Humanities and Social Sciences at the University of St. Gallen. Dr. Barassi's work has appeared in top-ranked international journals and edited collections. Her most recent book, Child Data Citizen, How Tech Companies Are Profiling Us from Before Birth, was published in December 2020 and is an examination of the datification of family life and in particular, how our children have become data subjects. Veronica, thank you so much for being here with us today. So good to talk to you again. How are you? I'm good, thank you. I'm really delighted to be here. It's super to have you. How's everything in Switzerland these days? It's good. We're living in strange times uh, and the weather is pretty crazy as well. <laughs> we have two days of snow and then 90 degrees or so. It's quite uh, crazy, but uh, it's lovely at the same time. So I can't complain. Great. Uh, this is a very interesting conversation. You and I and my colleague, Dr. Martin Farrows, have talked a number of times before about privacy. And obviously, it's something that's very close to all of our hearts. And in fact, we collaborated a couple of years ago now on that UN submission about children's rights. Uh, so this is a, a conversation that, in fact, I think it's becoming, if possible, even more important over time, even in the last couple of years that we've been talking, right? Yes, I think uh, I think uh, um, we we started to talk about these issues around 2018. I think uh, uh, following uh, a report uh, on uh, um, the type of data that was being collected uh, from the home that I had written, um, and uh, and since then things have changed massively. Uh, partly because uh, we've seen new technological developments. We've seen an increasing use in home technologies and voice-operated technologies, but also, uh, most significantly, uh, we have uh, witnessed the last year of the pandemic, uh, which uh, uh, has come for those who have been studying uh, data privacy, uh, the issue of profiling, um, the problem of uh, data mining connected to human rights. The pandemic uh, um, has come a bit as a shock because a lot of the um, technologies and a lot of those data uh, tracking practices that we were worried about before <laughs> have been amplified yeah. uh, and uh, and so i think yes we are it's very good to start the conversation again when we think about technology and data we often treat adults and kids the same right but they're very different and their their data protection needs are very different Yes, I agree. Um, first of all, I think uh, we have to be. Um, I, I think we have to be honest with ourselves in the sense that uh, personally, I was uh, um, very. Um, I felt very lucky that we we were connected. You know that we had a technologically connected world because when the pandemic hit. Uh, a lot of uh, my everyday life moved online and, uh, and, and I was in a strange time in my life because I just relocated to, to, uh, to Switzerland and my daughter could start her new school online and, uh, and I could start my new job online. I mean, it's not an ideal time to be starting a new job, a new life, a new school, but I felt very grateful that we had those technologies in place uh, to, to be able to continue to do, to, to, carry on with our lives. Um, and at the beginning, there was a lot of enthusiasm. And I think that that was, uh, um, it, it was a very important, it was important that we, we were enthusiastic about it because it, it was definitely good and beneficial. At the same time, uh, we've started seeing uh, an over-reliance on these technologies. We also started seeing uh, the introduction of uh, surveillance softwares in homeschooling, in uh, home uh, work, in home office, and, uh, and the use of uh, new surveillance technologies to track people, right? So we were talking about uh, the implications of contact tracing apps, and now we're talking about the implications of vaccine passports. So um, again, the privacy debates uh, changed massively over the last year. And the question about children is key. Um, what, what we need to understand when we talk about privacy is that uh, um, there is a difference between uh, uh, privacy 
uh, when we when we are speaking about adults and uh, adult technological use, uh, and privacy when we are talking about children and children's technological use, and uh, and this uh, obviously this difference uh, in online technology has been there since 1998 with the COPPA, right? When the Child Online uh, Privacy Protection Act was introduced, it was a clear understanding that uh, we had to draw a line between the data gathering uh, bit, uh, of adults and the data gathering of children. Um, but uh, I think that um, at the heart of these debates really lies a fundamental question, which is uh, about uh, um, children's right to uh, freedom and autonomy and, uh, and, and, and their basic human rights, especially when it comes to uh, data privacy. Um, this is because the children of today, they've been born uh, at a historical time where we, are, where we have seen the development of really complex data environments that are there to gather large amounts of personal data and to use this data to judge people, to profile them and to make decisions about that, right? And um, so when you're talking about children's data privacy, you're not only talking about uh, uh, their, their right not to be surveilled or their right, uh, they were talking about their actually their right to, to um, moral autonomy, their right to self-representation, their right to, to, um, to grow up and be who they are without being judged on the basis of the data traces that are being collected uh, during their childhood. So that's why there is a, a fundamental difference in, uh, in uh, children's rights uh, when it comes to privacy and, uh, and adults' rights uh, when it comes to privacy. Uh, the other fundamental difference is, of course, that most of the data of children that is being processed is processed through parental consent. So they had not consented to this. And, uh, and as a lot of different research is emerging, they have strong opinions about this. Um, so what, 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 you, what we need to think when we're thinking about children's data privacy is that historically as society, especially in the Western world, we always confine children like to the margins. They've always been understood as future citizens as something that was about to become. And obviously the work of Sonia Livingston at the LSE is fundamental in this regard because she really shows actually that children have really uh, strong uh, uh, opinions about their digital practices, their data rights and so on. And, um, and what the new data environments are doing, they're kind of stripping increasingly more children of their autonomy. Uh, they're still treating, you know, they, they, we are kind of amplifying against a problem that was already there. So this is what concerns me when we're talking about children's data privacy. Uh, that is a very complex issue, but it also that it carries a historical, um, historic tendency to, to not recognize the civic rights of children. When it comes to adults signing the T's and C's of a new app or a new toy that is interactive or you know a new game for their kids what typically is the data that they are consenting for those technologies to gather and use well the real problem is that and i think that that's, that kind of emerged quite well during my research and then when i was writing my book i think that the real problem is that um the Adults agree to um, share data, which they believe it's often consumer data. You know, so many of the parents that I work with they would tell me, well, you know, why do I care if uh, uh, they know what diapers I buy? You know, I buy these diapers because I like them, but even if they have that information, it's not going to affect me in any way or it's not going to affect my child in any way, right? So there's this tendency to believe that actually most of our digital uh, interactions are consumer interactions and they're about... Uh, mundane aspects of our lives that who cares if uh, somebody else knows about that, right? So this, there is kind of this, uh, this tendency to, to, uh, uh, to perceive things in this way. Mind you that I think amongst families, there is also a transformation at the moment, especially following the Cambridge Analytica yeah. uh, scandal in 2018 that parents started to get, get, you know, get increasingly more concerned that, that there was something more going on. Uh, but usually the parents that I talk to in the UK, in the US, mostly at the beginning, they were not really concerned, especially around 2016, 2017, they were like, yeah, you know, that's our goal. But the real problem is that uh, when we're talking about uh, our 
the new complex data environments that I was mentioning before. Um, the boundary between consumer data and, and, and citizen data has become blurred in many ways right. because uh, uh, most of the data that we produce through consumers' platforms is then repackaged and sold in profiles. And then uh, and, and these profiles can be used uh, most of the times to judge us or to determine, I don't know, if we are uh, good candidates for a job, uh, if we have a history of mental illness, if we have anything, right? So there are really sensitive uh, aspects of our lives that are actually coming to the fore uh, through our everyday digital habits. So, and uh, and I think that, that um, families are starting to realize this. And there's kind of, uh, um, it's becoming, the issue of privacy is becoming uh, more important nowadays. Uh, but still, uh, there's a lot of work to be done in this set, in sense of uh, raising awareness of how uh, even the very most mundane details that are being collected from a family home actually can be used to profile them. Yeah. You talk a lot about companies' kind of strategy to collect data over a lifetime. Yeah, I mean, my it's more of an hypothesis, because we, of course we don't know what's going to happen in 30, 30 years' time. But what we are seeing uh, increasingly more is that over the last 20 years, again, we've seen the establishment of these data environments. When I say data, complex data environments, it seems like a pompous word, but actually what we've seen, it was since 2002, uh, you have, uh, uh, we have seen a change in the business model of digital companies uh, in the sense that uh, data became uh, the new oil, right? So Zubov, for instance, talks about the rise of surveillance capitalism, and she describes how Google was at the center of this. Like in 2002, she says Google, uh, came up with the idea that there was going to be a behavioral surplus uh, and that uh, basically that we could make money out of the uh, of the added uh, data that we could uh, out of added data out of uh, personal data we could and we could ma uh, make money uh, because uh, uh, we could uh, predict what people wanted, right? So there was this idea that actually the data of individuals could be used to predict what they wanted and then retarget content. And so. But that, and that was a very kind of, if you want, it was a very um, interesting business move that came right after the dot-com crash. Uh, it was the idea of making money for the digital economy, right? And, and recreate the digital economy. Now we have 21 years almost, well, 20, yeah, 20 years of this, right? No, 90. Uh, but uh, after 19 years of this, uh, what we are actually seeing is that all the world around us has started to collect a lot of data from uh, different areas of social life. And they use that data to profile us. And so all these technologies are being used by police, yeah, they're being used by the government, they're being used by um, employers, they're being used all around us, right? Now, in this situation, you have uh, the big tech companies that have been harnessing this data for over this for, for, for the, the, the space of 20 years. And that at the moment are harnessing the data also of children uh, from, the, from zero to 13 years of age through their own platforms. Right. Now, of course, these technologies, because they are designed and targeted for children, they uh, they have to comply with the special pri uh, privacy protection regulations that are uh, designed for children, right, in different countries. But, uh, like you were saying, we do not have the certainty that after the age of 13, when the child is going to open his own uh Google account or Facebook account or whatever, this data is not integrated. We know that the companies have the means to, to integrate this under unique ID profiles. The other thing that we know as well is that all these different big tech companies are investing in different public sectors. So they're investing in education, they're investing in health, they're also investing on social media platforms. So they have all this, and they're investing in home technologies. So you have all this, uh, areas of investment and areas of data collection. And you have the means, uh, of, I mean, you have companies that have the means to aggregate all this data and they have the potential of following an individual across a lifetime. Uh, so this is, uh, uh, this is what's happening at the moment. Now, we don't know exactly what's gonna happen in 20 years time, uh, but we know that uh, what's happening at the moment is a reason for concern. Uh, especially when it comes uh, to the idea of uh, somebody being profiled across a lifetime. Absolutely. And, and 
Let's talk for a minute about voice data in particular, us being a, a, a voice tech company specifically for children. What is the difference between voice data and other personal data that is out there and available to these companies now? Well, I think that voice technologies are uh, are particularly interesting in the sense uh, for for two different reasons. On the one hand, uh, um, it is because of the technology itself, right? So there is a lot of uh, uh, research uh, which has shown that uh, um, voice uh, um, voice operated technologies uh, give it a different sense of uh, human computer interaction, right? A different feeling to it. Um, some people would say they give uh, a greater degree of trust. Other talk about greater emotional connection. Again, there is not like the, in, in, in the different uh, uh, discipline, there is no real uh, a shared understanding of this. And, uh, and the research is at the very beginning. But uh, what we can say is that, yes, voice, uh, voice uh, uh, operated technologies offer a different level of interaction. Um, that we had seen before. Having said this, this actually implies that most probably the type of, of uh, data that they're willing to share could be much more personal, much more sensitive, much more uh, deep in, in the sense, right? So, um, and, uh, and again, so th that's one aspect of, of voice technologies. The other aspect of voice technologies is actually that most of the voice technologies that children interact with are in their home. And, and so uh, these technologies are actually gathering large amounts of really hyper, hyper contextual data of the home. They're, they're gathering not only the data about the ch child, but the data about uh, the family behavior, the household behavior, uh, and, and so on. So you have that um, when you're talking about voice data. And the other aspect of voice data is, of course, that, that it could be turned into biometric data. And once it's turned into biometric data, it's, uh, it's personally identifiable. You know, it's like a fingerprint. It stays, right? It's like, constantly attached to that. Um, so I think that voice data is uh, uh, like face, like facial data in many ways, um, but although not with that level of interaction, uh, voice data is, is quite different from other types of data in that sense. Um, yeah, very much so. You, you can learn a lot from somebody's voice. Oh, true. yeah, exactly. Um, which is wonderful and which makes it such a powerful tool and such a fun tool for a kid to use a voice enabled toy. I mean, how much more fun is that than, than a toy that, that doesn't have that level of interactivity? And I think this brings us very nicely on to something that we at Soapbox Labs and you are very passionate about, which is privacy by design. You know, the, the richness of that voice data and all data and how it can be used and misused. You're an advocate for privacy by design and you work with companies like ours who are privacy by design and privacy first companies. Tell us what privacy by design means to you and why it's a non-negotiable as far as you're concerned. Well, I think that privacy by design is uh, is a bold and important move that businesses need to take, especially if they want to protect children's rights. I mean, most of the uh, tech uh, businesses aimed at children should be privacy by design, as far as I'm concerned. Um, and uh, and I think uh, again because of this historical transformation that we've been living in, and uh, over the last twenty years, uh, we actually. Um, we actually created a world where we are constantly exposed. Our data is constantly collected, and uh, and we do not have any control over this data. And yes, we have uh, um, the general data protection regulations in 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 Europe, for instance, where I could potentially uh, claim back my data or ask a company yeah. to delete my data or or ask about how they're profiling me. But personally, you know, I'm a mother of two. I have a full-time job. How on earth am I going to find the time to follow each company that collected my data, right? And so um, what at the moment we are, we are witnessing is, uh, a, a, the, again, the rise of these data environments that expose us and that uh, can have a, 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 an impact on our, on our civic rights. Um, we have data protection regulations that are being too slow and they're often inadequate uh, in protecting us. And so if, uh, I, I, I strongly believe that one of the most important solutions is to literally uh, break the idea that uh, to 
to to have a good business, you have to mine people's data there, uh, and to just actually start to thinking about how to be more socially responsible. Especially because the next, in the near future, it is going to be much more AI driven. So most of the data that is going to be processed by data brokers is going to be then be processed more and more and more by uh, artificial intelligence technologies, and uh, and we we have no no. We don't, we don't know what's going to happen, really. Uh, we know that most of the, the algorithms have biases. We know that uh, most of the data is biased and wrong and misconstrued. And so um, I think that at the moment, it's really important for businesses to step back a second and thinking what type of society we're building. Uh, yeah. And to do that uh, is that one, one fundamental step is really to be committed to privacy by design. Yeah, which actually ensures us that, yes, we can use technologies. Yes, we can have uh, a social robot at home and have children have fun with a social robot. Yes, yes, we can have all that. But without this constant constant threat that our data is being harnessed and that my children are being profiled or, uh, or that uh, um, in the future, whatever they say in their home, they might be at some point used, right? So this is for what we are living in at the moment. And I think that privacy by design is not only a very bold move for by businesses, but it's also a, a very important uh, and responsible move. I find it amazing that technology companies don't think about building for children separately from the way they build for adults and how that is something. Do, do you think that's changing? I mean, we do see the, the slow rise, I would say, of kids' tech but it's still very emerging. Well, uh, so I think that there are, there are two levels to that question. So the first level is the fact that at the moment we have uh, a lot of uh, uh, technologies that process children's data, but they're not designed or targeted at children. Uh, and so they don't have to abide to the special protection regulations for children. <laughs> That's as simple as that. Right. So you have children speaking to virtual assistants. You have uh, uh, children data on social media platforms and on the profiles of the adults that it's being used. Well, it's being collected. We don't know exactly what's, what's happening to that data. But we know that there is no special protection regulations for all the data that uh, is being gathered from platforms that are not designed for children but that nevertheless children's use or that children uh, or where children data is actually stored. So that's our first problem. The second problem when it comes to technologies and children is the fact uh, that uh, you have uh, um, mostly you have technologies uh, uh, that are designed and thought uh, for uh, with an adult mind. Uh, so there is at the moment there is there is different uh, um, research centers and different people that are working on this idea of creating uh, uh, design uh, children led design for technology, which is actually really positive. Yeah. Um, and uh, and I think that that's uh, a very important move uh, uh, as well when when it comes to tech design and children. You know, but. but um, and the other thing that we have, which is the third problem that we have, is that. Uh, um, there is not that much uh, research uh, on, uh, uh, specifically when it comes to voice uh, and voice operated uh, technologies uh, and children. So, uh, and, that's, uh, and that's something that is very important as well, because uh, most, as I was saying uh, before, most of the technologies that we are seeing today are relatively new. Uh, so we don't know the impacts, we don't know the implications, we don't know the interactions, we have assumptions, we have research, but it's still so uh, confused, uh, the, the situation on the ground. How is it that, that children are really experiencing these technologies? Uh, are, and uh, so I think the three different dimensions kind of intersect when, uh, when we're talking about uh, um, businesses that are, talking, uh, are, are targeted at children or design technologies for their children. Um, because uh, they don't have to only take into account uh, the data protection issues, but they also have to take into account the real needs of children and the fact that there is no real research on the fact of what really children want. So, uh, and what are the implications and impacts of their technologies, right? So, um, so I think that these are the, the three different um, aspects that we need to take into consideration when we're talking about uh, children's tech. And obviously they're different. So. Yeah, they're different, but they are connected. And any kid will tell you they can spot a mile off 
uh, technology that hasn't been built with them in mind that, you know, something that's written that isn't written by somebody who understands the kids, kids voices or what they're interested in. And um, they're so attuned to uh, what is kids specific and what is uh, of the moment for them that, uh, and they have low tolerance for the things that won't work for inaccurate technology or for, uncool looking graphics are <laughs> right so it seems to be a huge opportunity for companies to become kid specific yeah but i think it's, it's a huge but i also actually pushes it pushes us to think the type of technologies that we design right so uh, more and more we're talking at the moment about algorithmic bias we're talking about how technologies have been designed by white men and the, how they t- don't take into account uh, minorities how they don't uh, um, don't take account of the children. They don't take into account anything that it's not like the adult male in many ways, right? Thank you. And uh, and that's uh, and that's uh, something that uh, we constantly need to um, uh, re- realize that most of our technologies are in some ways some there's some ways like. Um, scientific discoveries, right? But when we're doing it, when we're creating a technology, uh, we often have a standard human in mind, uh, like Stefan Milan from uh, uh, from Amsterdam would say. We often have this idea of what what is the ideal user of that, like, and it comes when it comes when in any type of technology. Um, and of course, uh, unfortunately, our imaginary is very very narrow when we're talking about what type of humans are using these technologies and what type of uh, and how we can account uh, uh, for differences. And, uh, and for the plurality and the vastity of human experience and behavior and cultural uh, negotiation and so on. So, uh, and I think with the example of kids tech, that's obvious. That's what I'm saying. I think we really need more research in this. We need cross culture on the research about you know how children work with boys, and uh, we need uh, you know proper qualitative uh, data to understand uh, what is their interaction and uh, and how we can inform design, right? Okay. Um, so yeah. Veronica, one quick last question for you, if you don't mind. If you had one, I mean, it seems obvious from the conversation that we have had, but I think just to kind of wrap it up in a nutshell, you know, we're a privacy by design company. You're a privacy by design advocate. If you were to, if you were to, to, to ask big tech companies, what would be one thing that not just big tech companies, but all tech companies need to do uh, to protect children's fundamental data privacy, what would it be? Actually, there are two requests I would ask, really. The first one is uh, for any tech company that is actually having access to data, children's data through adult profiles. So whether we're talking about a social media platform or a, a home technology, uh, and you, are, you, you really have the, all that data that is coming from the interactions with children or with coming from the children's photos uh, or any other type of data. Um, my request would be to delete delete any d- data that is gathered, any children's data that is gathered through ad, ad profile uh, because uh, uh, the, it, the fact that, that this data has been processed through adult profiles actually puts uh, uh, children in a much in a much more risky position in the sense that their data is not protected, minimally protected. So that's my first uh, uh, request. And the second request really, it will be for uh, any tech company working on uh, on, on children uh, uh, on is to really think about what, how they could restructure their business with a privacy by design idea. Uh, because uh, there are ways to do really cool technologies for children without uh, having to harness their data. There's, there are ways in which you can actually create value uh, without uh, uh, exposing children uh, to the uh, complexity and, and the injustice of our contemporary data environments. So uh, yes, those are the two things that I would uh, ask. Soapbox Labs is on a mission to transform play and learning experiences for kids using voice technology. Our proprietary technology powers literacy and language tools, smart toys, games and robots for kids as young as two years old and has been built using a privacy by design approach. To license our kids specific voice tech, 
or to learn more about us, email hello at soapboxlabs.com. This is Neve Bushnell. Thanks so much for listening.